joining us here at Crow. My name is Rachel Rangel and I'm the Education and Outreach Director here. Uh, and today's we, uh, session on Wildlife Wednesday with Crow is on the American alligators. I know they are a very iconic symbol for us here at the state of Florida and we have quite a few of them, believe it or not, here in the state of Florida as well as across the southern United States. So I thought it applicable to talk to you about them today so we can learn a little bit about why these animals are so important to our environment and really what benefits do they have to us here. Uh, before we get started with alligators though, I do wanna begin by talking a little bit about reptiles as a whole. Uh, I have been mentioning them on and off the last few weeks that we've been doing Wildlife Wednesdays, a little uh, bit here and there. And I wanted to talk about uh, the study of reptiles known as herpetology. So uh, herpetology is the study of reptiles and amphibians. So therefore our cold-blooded friends. And the study of herpetology is so important to our environment, particularly in this day and age, because reptiles are what is known as, and amphibians are cold-blooded. So that doesn't necessarily mean that their blood is cold, but rather that they cannot regulate their body temperatures uh, internally like we can. They actually must rely on the environment that they're in to determine that. So as we go through periods of warming as well as periods of cooling with our global climate change, reptiles are going to be extra sensitive to that. So the, one of the reasons why it is important to study animals like alligators, snakes, turtles, and lizards is because of how susceptible um, they are to changes in the environment. And that will come in later to play as we go on with our program today. Now, believe it or not, alligators used to be on, uh, used to be extinct. So back in the late 40s, early 50s, uh, alligators were really at risk for becoming extinct as a species due to primarily over harvesting of their meat and skin as well as due to habitat destruction of their wetland areas. So uh, back in 1967, there was a law put into effect that predated the Endangered Species Act of 1973 to list alligators um, on there and so to put a little bit more regulation behind them. So what started in place was really just primarily education as well as tagging limits and more regulations involved with the harvesting of alligators. There was also the, uh, the permits enacted in place for alligator farming, sustainable alligator farming. And because of education and those efforts, alligators continued to make a comeback. So now in the state of Florida, there is an estimated 1.3 million alligators that now list uh, live in Florida. So alligators in many ways are one of the success stories of how um, conservation efforts can be put into practice and how uh, beneficial that can be for them as a species. Now in uh, Florida, there are 67 counties. Because of the types of habitats that we have here in our state, alligators are actually found in all 67 counties. In fact, the largest documented alligator that was found in the state of Florida to date was in Alachua County. And that alligator, I believe, was about a little over 13 feet long. Uh, when we think about alligators, we also uh, look at their image and we see a very robust, strong, uh, almost armor-plated creature. And so I do also want to talk a little bit about the physical adaptations or physical body parts that these animals have as a species that really make them keen hunters and more adapted to the marshland and wetland areas. So they are covered in scales as all reptiles are, but alligators have specially adapted armor plates known as scutes. Scutes act as a good defense for them, both from competing uh, alligators as well as um, other animals that would try to outcompete them for their resources. Uh, with their feet, their feet are specially designed to be uh, adaptable as well. So their feet um, are well equipped to help them walk on land as well as swim in the water. Now when they are in the water, it can make it a little bit more difficult for them to breathe. So it is also nice that their nostrils 
are placed on the top part of their mouth as well as their eyes. That does allow them to uh, stalk their prey or observe um, other animals from a distance while still being mostly submerged in water. I brought up them being ectotherms. So when you are an ectotherm or a cold-blooded animal, you do have to rely on the environmental changes. And so that means that the best time to see uh, most of your reptiles is going to be after the sun has come up. Uh, when it's a little bit uh, warmer in the day, but not too hot. Because once it gets too hot, a lot of our reptile neighbors, they do kind of sequester themselves in more shaded areas or in their shelter or dens. And um, with the seasonality of our weather changes as well, uh, we are starting to get into those warmer months, which means we are also kicking off alligator nesting season. So the courtship of alligators does begin in about April or May, and the laying just uh, uh, the laying and nest building commences, and then following that, the ladies will deposit their eggs in their nest. However, during the cooler months, when we tend to get most of our snowbirds, both our migratory birds as well as our migratory migratory people, uh, alligators tend to be a lot more reclusive, and that's because. Um, they are most active when temperatures are going to be somewhere between 82 to 92 degrees Fahrenheit. They love that muggy weather, but they stop feeding and they start being more reclusive when ambient temperatures or kind of the natural temperatures around us become around 70 degrees or below. And then they become dormant altogether when, it, when weather reaches about 55 degrees Fahrenheit. That's another reason because alligators become so inactive during those uh, colder periods, why they're usually not found more northern than the Sun Belt. Now in terms of their home range, we're talking about the Sun Belt and discussing that here. Alligators are pretty broad as a creature. The American alligator is found in a lot of the southern parts of the United States. Obviously, it can be found in all 67 counties of Florida, but it can be found as north as southern, uh, as North Carolina and as far west as Texas. So um, they are usually found in freshwater. They are more well equipped biologically, which I'll discuss a little bit later, for freshwater bodies um, and slow moving rivers. And they also live in swamps, marshes, and lakes. Although alligators can be seen since it does a coastal area in salt water from time to time, they will not usually stay too far in salt water because they lack uh, physical uh, body parts that allow them to stay in salt water for long periods of time. They also benefit the ecosystems here in Florida. So one of the reasons why we should be respecting alligators overall as, an, as a wild animal is because of time periods like this. So uh, here in Florida, we are currently going through our, our drought spell here until our hurricane season begins in June. And so during the drier periods of the months, alligators become crucial to other species of wildlife. So alligators rely on having water around them, at least available as a resource. And so they dig uh, holes and burrows called refugia. And when the water starts to get pretty dry out, those um, alligator holes where the water collects are usually some of the only areas where a lot of our wading birds can find food. So um, any, any our wading birds, birds that rely on a certain amount of level of water to forage are gonna be like our spoonbills, um, our egrets, our herons. Those birds rely on coexisting um, with our alligators to do that. Now, when the alligators create these depressions in the marshes or in the swamps, um, usually they're either going to be in a combination of muck or limestone uh, bedrock. The water results in a uh, filling basin. So again, the water collects there. A lot of your uh, uh, smaller fish will collect there. And the alligators will actually maintain that hole. That is their uh, main source of resources themselves. And so they're usually going to be very aggressive around their gator holes as well. Alligators uh, for Florida also.
also benefit us financially. So per the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity, a lot of people come down here specifically to see our charismatic megafauna, which includes our alligators. So alligators, again, are a staple of Florida, and it has been estimated through the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity that uh, national and state parks generate over um, $967 million, and that was back uh, in 2011 that those statistics were provided. So not only are alligators benefiting us on an environmental level, but they're also benefiting us on a financial level. So um, oftentimes people try to justify what are some of the reasons why we need to be protecting these animals that we do. Well, you just look at some of the financial statistics and that'll give you the motivation. But alligators do also look very similar to our um, saltwater crocodiles. So the American saltwater crocodile is found in the Americas, not necessarily uh, in the United States per se, but in other parts of Central and South America. Uh, uh, the saltwater crocodile is actually um, their uh, northernmost point of their habitat range currently is middle to southern Florida. And that's because alligators tend to be a lot more susceptible to colder climates than our alligators are. So where the alligators kind of go into a sense of being dormant, um, saltwater crocodiles can actually die if the, if the weather stays too cold for too long. Uh, but alligators and crocodiles, therefore, because they're both found in Florida, tend to cohabitate in some of these similar places. Now, as their name implies, uh, crocodiles are a lot more well-equipped to adapt to uh, saltwater environments, whereas your alligators are more well-adapted to your freshwater bodies. And the areas in the environment in Florida where these animals tend to uh, kind of get a little bit closer to each other is the estuary areas. So this is gonna be places where fresh and salt water mix together. A lot of these areas are going to be nesting grounds for our rickery birds. They're going to be nesting areas for a lot of our sports fish. So this will be areas where they'll be tend to found, um, not necessarily side by side because they they get into uh, interspecies aggression. They'll fight with each other if there's not enough habitat, but they can be found in these areas. So when you are looking out for an alligator or a crocodile, I use this illustration as kind of a humorous example, but they look fairly similar unless you know what to uh, keep an eye out for to determine whether or not what you're seeing is an alligator versus a crocodile. So the biggest tip to look out for with alligators and crocodiles is gonna be the snout or the um, mouth area. So with your alligators, they tend to have quite a bit more of a blunted or a U-shaped mouth whereas your crocodiles, their mouths tend to come to a point. So they're known as having a V-shaped snout. Um, the other thing to look at is the mouth. Uh, with the way that their mouths are designed, when an alligator has its mouth closed, you can only see the upper layer of their teeth versus the way that the crocodile nose is shaped. When their mouth is closed, you can actually see the teeth overlapping. So you can notice both the upper as well as the lower teeth. Uh, again, their habitat, alligators will be mostly found in fresh water. Um, although I myself have seen alligators sighted at coastal areas from time to time, whereas your crocodiles, if you'll see them, they'll most of the time be found in salt water. Uh, the reasons why crocodiles are more well equipped for saltwater bodies is because they have something called lingual salt glands. So this is a microscopic uh, viewpoint of their tongue. Uh, crocodile tongues have these special glands that are a modified salivary gland. And this gland on their tongue actually allows them to secrete the salt from the salt water. Uh, Crocodiles, adversely, not necessarily saltwater related, are also a little bit better in some instances at hunting than alligators. And that's because crocodiles have more dermal pressure receptors. So these are gonna be little black dotted sensory pits found on their face. Now alligators also have these dermal
thermal pressure receptors, but those are going to be primarily located just at the mouth, whereas your crocodiles can have them all around their body. So in some way, crocodiles are more adapted to be specialized hunters than your alligators. Uh, getting back to nesting season, again, we are now in the courtship period of alligators. Um, alligators do not have uh, vocal cords per se. So what happens is during certain times of the day or late in the evening, you might hear a low grumbling bellowing sound. So despite the fact that they lack vocal cords, uh, male alligators, the bull alligators, they will actually be causing large vibrations in the water with their throats and uh, they'll be making this growling, uh, grumbling sound. And that's to both establish a territory, discouraging other males from coming to their habitat, as well as to encouraging females to come and um, accept them as a mate. So uh, the breeding will begin in May. So we are now at the start of the breeding portion of nesting season. And then the females will start making their nests. So uh, with nests, uh, you do need heat. It is important to um, incubate the nests. The female alligators will actually start gathering uh, nesting material. Uh, it'll be a combination of sticks, moist leaves. Uh, because alligators do not physically sit on their nest to incubate the eggs like birds do, by gathering this uh, dead organic nesting material, as the uh, debris begins to dry out and decay, it starts absorbing heat and incubating that, that nest. So even though the female doesn't physically sit on the nest the whole time, the eggs are getting the heat and moisture that they need to develop within the egg. Now, during that nesting period, um, again, something that's a little bit different from birds to reptiles is when a bird has laid an egg, it will continuously rotate the egg to um, keep it even, uh, evenly distributed, the heat and the incubation. With reptiles, like your alligators, your uh, turtles, and your snakes, the eggs need to stay put. Um, the parents don't rotate their nest. Particularly with turtle eggs, once the egg is laid, after 24 hours, if you are to rotate the egg at all, the embryo will detach from the egg and the young will die. So the eggs need to stay put in that nest the entire incubation. Also, during incubation, the temperature at which the nest incubates will predetermine whether or not those, egg, those babies will become a male or a female. Now, for most of your reptiles, warmer temperatures turns to uh, females and colder temperatures turn to males. Now, the difference in temperature that can determine whether or not it becomes a male or a female is only a couple degrees or so. So as we're talking about that global climate change, those fluctuations in the environment can really throw off an entire species. Now with your alligators and your crocodiles, it tends to be the adverse. So now it's the warmer temperatures will give you males and the colder temperatures will give you females. Uh, and then the egg incubation ranges from somewhere between 63 to 68 days. So if your eggs are laid and deposited in the nest and become incubated, um, they'll start hatching somewhere in between August and September. That's when you'll start noticing your young. And um, about one out of every three nests that is laid by a female alligator will become destroyed. So it is a very rough time for alligators and really any wild animals to have nests just because they have so many factors that they're dealing with on a regular basis related to habitat destruction. So um, they could have predators, they could have uh, car collisions, a whole lot of things. And weather, um, even though it's our, our getting ready to be hurricane season, too much moisture can actually uh, be bad for the nests as well. Then we get our adults versus juveniles. So an average adult alligator will range somewhere between 9 to 12 feet long and 750 to 800 pounds. Now, 
with your alligators, they tend to become sexually mature adults where they can start reproducing at somewhere between six to seven feet long. Um, now, uh, with your alligators, the males tend to get uh, larger than the females. And the average lifespan of these uh, animals is going to be somewhere between 35 to 50 years. Now, hatchlings, when they first come out of the egg, they're going to average from the tip of their nose to the tip of their tail, somewhere between six, inch, six to eight inches long. And they will congregate in groups called pods. Now, when you think about babies and parenting, um, there are going to be very different parenting styles depending on the type of animal that you are interacting with or that you're viewing. So with birds, typically both the mother and the father actively participate in the raising process of the young. With mammals, it tends to be just the mother's job. And usually with reptiles, once the eggs are deposited and the nest is secure, the babies are on their own from the time they hatch until the time they die. Now, alligators are one of the few species of reptiles that will actively um, take care of their young, but just the mothers. The mothers are very aggressive of these young alligators until they're somewhere between one to two years old, depending on how self-sufficient they are as youngsters. Um, that is why during a, a hatchling season when these babies are coming out if you happen to see a baby alligator nearby it is best to pay attention to your surroundings because more often than not there's going to be a very aggressive mother nearby as well so never get too close to a baby alligator no matter how cute they are now the average clutch size or, or amount of eggs that a female will lay is going to be about 38 of those 38, about 24 hatchlings will emerge or come out of that egg, but only about 10 will make it to their first year. And then of that, about eight will become a sub-adult where they reach about four foot in length. And then finally, only about five will become um, a sub-adult that will reach maturity, which is again about six feet long. So of that original 38 eggs, only about five will make it to um, a fully functioning adult where they can start contributing to the species again. Uh, why, why is this the case? Again, we were talking a little bit about natural disasters. Um, rainstorms happen, they can wash out nests, they can drown them. Um, eggs in particular are really susceptible to predation. Any uh, wildlife that eats eggs out in nature, uh, raccoons are probably gonna be one of the number one predators of alligator nests. But you can also, um, otters will occasionally eat eggs. Um, some species of fish, like fish crows will. And then once they hatch and they're small little hatchling gators, really uh, I've seen pictures of great blue herons eating them, great egrets, and really anything that can get a hold of these baby alligators. Once they get to be older, um, and even in their infancy, it's also not uncommon for other alligators who are older and bigger to eat, try to eat them as well. So alligators are one of the few animals in the animal kingdom that will actively choose to engage in cannibalism if there are a lack of resources in the environment. So that's another reason why the female alligator protects the young because the daddy might try to eat them. Bad daddy. <laughs> so um, alligators are very aggressive towards each other as well. But hazards don't only go from alligator to alligator or alligator to wildlife. We also, as humans, have to be aware that alligators, although they are a very majestic, powerful, regal animal, they are also very dangerous as well. So there are certain tips that are listed through Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission that can educate you as the public on how to have safe interactions with alligators from a monitored distance. Some of those tips that I'm going to be talking about today include that alligators are mostly active at dawn and dusk. So if you are out and about, um, please do not go swimming at night. It is ill-advised. Alligators will typically try to eat things um, that go by movement. So if it is bad lighting out, they may not know that you're a human. Also, speaking of feeding, uh, please do not ever feed alligators or encourage behaviors that... Um, uh, lead to them thinking that people equal food. 
because most of the time when you have alligators that are deemed a nuisance alligator, where they're a potential threat to human or property safety, it's usually because they have been fed by other people. So we always say here that a fed gator is a dead gator. So please discourage that type of um, interactions with them. Uh, feeding them is known as a harassment, so it is illegal because these animals are still protected through the Endangered Species Act to harass or feed gators. So you can receive a fine and potentially jail time depending on the level of violation that you have done. And then again, be aware that alligators live in fresh water bodies, so um, do not go, uh, if you're out and about, just be aware that alligators do live there, that it's their home just as much as it is our home. Uh, if you do come across a potentially nuisance alligator, there is a uh, program called SNAP, the Statewide Nuisance Alligator Program that is specifically uh, managed through Florida Fish and Wildlife that evaluates whether or not an alligator is known as a, a nuisance alligator. Uh, as mentioned from a couple of weeks ago, um, uh, through our Wildlife uh, Wednesday session, a nuisance wild animal is one that either poses a threat to human safety or property safety. So uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife will send somebody out if you have a potentially nuisance gator evaluate it and if it is not a, a nuisance gator leave it alone and if it is have it removed so those are some of our uh, information about our american alligator here today at crow if you have additional uh information that you'd like to know we will be posting a few links to some interesting information about how to coexist with these animals safely on our comment section below uh, and again, if you like these Wildlife Wednesday sessions and you would like to support us here at Crow, please click on the donate button below or continue to visit our website. Uh, now the last thing for you here today, we always have a wildlife animal featured here at Crow. We have our very own educational animal, uh, Sydney the American Alligator. So Sydney uh, is going to be two here this fall. Uh, she is here as a result of a partnership that Crow has with a captive breeding program that raises them specifically for um, viewing purposes. So, so Rachel, there was one question about what is the um, alligator's best senses? Like how well can they smell? Do you want to answer it on? I'll just answer it in the tab. Okay. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming out here today, guys. And